Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bunty Chand, and on behalf of Asia Society India Center, we are delighted to welcome you all to this evening's discussion, Governance 2.0, which is a conversation emanating from the book Rebo Rebooting India, Realizing a Billion Aspirations, that explores how technology can be employed to transform government, create a series of citizen-friendly public institutions and deliver low-cost solutions to some of India's most pressing problems. And uh, our speakers this evening really uh, don't need much uh, introduction, particularly one of them, I think. And I am, uh, that's why we are seeing such a large attendance on a Saturday evening. And uh, the authors of the book are Mr. Nanda Nilekani, who is former chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India, and Viral Shah, who's founding partner of Julia Com Computing. And they will both be in conversation with Ruben Abraham, who's C CEO and senior fellow at IDFC Institute. And I get to give my little plug about the Asia Society. And if there are any people who are not members here, I really request you to become members of Asia Society today. Uh, as many of you do know, we work in the areas of policy and business, arts and culture, and we present creative cross-disciplinary perspectives, fresh insights, and informed ideas with diverse speakers. Through dialogue with leaders, thinkers, and citizens, we explore vital issues facing Asia on the global stage to create awareness and effect change. We share multiple points of view as we are an independent and non-partisan organization. And we hope that you, the audience, can put new and fresh ideas from Asia society into practice. We have many individual and corporate members in the audience today. And I would like to acknowledge that the financial support provided by our corporate individual and patron members keeps us operational in India. Asia Society in India raises all its money locally. So we have presented 500 programs in the past nine years as part of our mission to forge common ground to inspire and improve the world. So um, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have not been to an Asia Society program in the past? Oh, just not even 10%, so thank you. And um, how many of you found out about the program tonight from Facebook or Twitter? Very few. I, we have to change that. You can't come to an Asia Society program and not be on Facebook and Twitter. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's simply not allowed. Um, so we are very prolific on Facebook. So like us on Facebook. Join Facebook and you'll receive the most up-to-date information about the Asia Society and a regular stream of interesting articles that are linked to the programming that we conduct at Asia Society, as well as you know, uh, current affairs and the latest happenings in Asia. And please tweet about today's event. And don't forget to tag Asia Society IC um, uh, uh, when you tweet. And I would also like to thank our supporters for this evening. Uh, the new IDFC Bank is supporting the program today. So thank you. And uh, before I hand the stage over, I want the audience to respond to two quick statements. Um, please raise your hand if you have an Aadhaar. Wow. 70, 80, very good. <laughs> you should be pleased, Nandan. <laughs> And uh, the second question is a little naughty, which is, please raise your hand if you opted out of the LPG subsidy. Oh, very good. About 25 to 30%? If you're coming to an Asia Society program, I think you can opt out of the LPG subsidy. <laughs> and I would now like to invite Udyan Mitra, who's publisher Penguin Random House, and he will be introducing the speakers. And the flow of the evening is that there'll be uh, remarks by Nandan and Viral, and it'll be followed by a discussion with Ruben Abraham, and finally, an audience Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Uh, very good evening, everyone. My name is Udayan Mitra. I'm associate publisher at 
Penguin Random House in India, we are the proud publishers of the book Rebooting India, Nandan's new book co-written with Viral Shah. And uh, my very pleasant duty to introduce very briefly the, the authors and uh, Ruben Abraham, for those of you who do not know these people, which I think in this crowd are very few, but still. Um, so Nandan, uh, I mean, at, at the publishing house end, we know him as the best-selling author of Imagining India. But, uh, and it's been, uh, that was 2008, so it's been seven years since then, and uh, we really welcome the opportunity of publishing his new book. Uh, but he is, of course, as you all know, co-founder and former CEO of Infosys Technologies and uh, founding chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India. Um, Viral Shah, uh, his co-writer on this book, uh, worked alongside Nandan at the UIDAI. Viral is a PhD in computer science uh, from University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, he is a co-inventor of the programming language, Julia. Um, Ruben Abraham, who, uh, who will be in conversation with um, Nandan and Viral this evening, I would like to quickly introduce. Uh, Ruben is a CEO and senior fellow at IDFC Institute, and previously was a professor and executive director of the Center of Emerging Market Solutions at the um, ISB. Uh, where he continues to serve on the Next Generation Leaders Board. And uh, Ruben, of course, holds a PhD from Columbia. Uh, I would, at the outset, before I, I'll, I'll do a very quick introduction on the book, which is really kind of um, sort of how we lead into the evening, but really you'll hear all about the book in the conversation and, and the presentations that will follow. But uh, before I do that, I want to thank uh, Asia Society. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here, and it's wonderful to see, on a Saturday evening, no less, and it's wonderful to see so many young people in the crowd, because this is a book for the next generation. And I want to thank IDFC for partnering with us on this event. Uh, I think it's come together excellently. Um, on the book, so this is about realizing a billion aspirations. Uh, 1.25 billion to be precise, uh, that's, that's the current population of India. What are our aspirations? Uh, I think we all want to make our lives easier, more cost efficient, um, corruption free. And if we manage to do that, that would lead to true development, it would lead to inclusive growth. The only way to do this, Nandan and Viral is saying in this book, the only way to do this is to use technology in a disruptive fashion, and where do you use it? You use it right at the, at the governing level, at, at change government itself, change the way government works. And you've had a, a brilliant example of that in the Aadhaar project itself. It's been five years, 900 million people today, uh, and including everybody who raised their hands in the audience when the question was asked, is, is today an Aadhaar holder? And uh, that is truly incredible. It is the world's largest social identity program ever. And uh, that just shows you how quickly it can be done, how effectively it can be done, the kind of disruptions that they're talking about. They'll talk more about it as they present, but uh, this is really about, it covers the gamut from banking to government subsidies, uh, services, highway tolls, goods and services tax, education system, healthcare system, the election system, the judicial system, you, you name it. I mean, and what they're talking about is a highly skilled, enterprising group of people, small group of people going in there and changing things uh, in, in a disruptive fashion and making a major change that um, Essentially, it's, a, it's an initiative that is then uh, tremendously cost effective because, and you've seen that with the LPG cylinder thing already, but that's a very small example of what could actually, all the things that could be done. The initiatives that Nandan and Viral are suggesting in this book could save the government an incredible 100,000 crore a year. That's, if you want to really get into percentages, that is about 1% of GDP. 
So, uh, which is why I said this is a blueprint for transforming India. It's a book for the future. And uh, you'll hear more about this in a minute. Uh, before we get on to the rest of the evening, there are three people I want to thank, because I'm not going to come back here on stage. I, I want to thank them now. Uh, Swapnika Ramu, who's here in the audience. Swapnika, are you somewhere here? Can, will you stand up, please? There she is. She helped uh, with the research and the writing of this book. Aparna Ranjan, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but she has designed the lovely cover that you see. And uh, if, you've, if you've bought the book and opened it, you'll know that there are diagrams inside, which you'll also see as part of Nandan and Vero's presentations. And all of those are Aparna's handiwork, and I think they've made a real difference to the book. The third person I want to thank is uh, Samar Halrankar. He helped us in the final editorial process of the book, in, in the final product that was put together. And, and the book would not have been the same without him. So I would like to thank all three of these people. And uh, two final things. Um, please do put your cell phones on silent so that we can all enjoy the evening uninterrupted. And books are on sale right at the back of the room. Nandan and Viral will be happy to sign at the, after the event. Now, uh, before we move on, can, can I invite on stage Nandan, Viral, Ruben, uh, first for the formal unwrapping of the book. And then I believe Nandan will talk about the book, then Viral will talk about the book, and then we lead into the discussion. <laughs> Folks, uh, and thank you to the Isha Society for uh, hosting this event, uh, which is the Bombay book launch of a book, uh, Rebooting India, Realizing a Billion Aspirations. Uh, this uh, book came out of our experience in government. I, I joined the government about five years back with no experience of working in any Sarkari system. And uh, I was given the assignment to give a unique ID to everyone in India, which is more than a billion people. And uh, I, we made a commitment very early that we would give 600 million people an ID before we ended in five years. And we actually delivered that in four and a half years. So it, it's uh, also the, the, the initial budget was you know, over 10,000 crores, and it was delivered in about 7,000 crores. So fundamentally, it's one of those rare projects which was done ahead of time and below the budget. So I think it was a fairly good experience uh, of doing that. And today, uh, the same project, as you know, has been uh, embraced by the new government. Yesterday, there was a full day conference in uh, Delhi called JAM, which is Jandan Aadhaar Mobile, and how to use that for reforming the system. And the prime minister spoke, the finance minister spoke, several chief ministers spoke, uh, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu, Mr. Fadnes, and uh, also uh, Mr. Raman Singh and the petroleum minister spoke. And they all spoke about how they're going to use Aadhaar and do the cash transfer. So I think it was good that it's got a wide base of uh, acceptance. So I think uh, the experience uh, taught us a lot in how to navigate the system. Not easy navigating the system, as you know. And uh, how to plan, how to strategize, and so on. And we also came to the conclusion that this is what we did here is, is perhaps replicable that uh, it's not just about one one-off project, but maybe this could be a template uh, for doing things uh, to really address India's challenges at scale and speed. And uh, when we looked at Indian history, we actually realized that there are many examples of uh, these kind of uh, entrepreneurial organizations inside the government. I mean, if you think about it, uh, when uh, Homi Baba started the atomic program, it, he had a lot of leeway and did a lot of very unusual things to make that work. And similarly, with the space program with Vikram Sarabhai and Satish Dhawan, they also got to do a lot of things and made that successful. Uh, the Green Revolution was completely an entrepreneurial exercise by uh, C. Subramaniam, M. S. Swaminathan, and Norman Borlaug. And even when you think about the NHAI in Prime Minister Vajpayee's time, that was also set up as a startup in government and was successful in really building the national highways. So we said maybe there's a template here because government 
as 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 an entity is designed for stability and you know doing the same thing over and over again it's not a system that's designed for uh, you know being trying to do disruptive things uh, and therefore if you want to really innovate in the system you need to create startups inside the government and this is true, you know, large corporations. Large corporations, too, if they're large and they want to do a new initiative, they'll create a small group or a startup. And that startup will then come out with something which then becomes bigger. And uh, important thing about a startup inside a large company or in the government is it needs to be protected because uh, it's a small fledgling baby unit and there are enough people out there who are trying to, you know, get it stopped. So it's very important that top level, CEO level in the case of the government, in the company or the prime minister in the case of the government should personally support these uh, initiatives and give them air cover because that's the air cover is critical to the, their success. So we looked at this as maybe uh, we looked at, we had actually done a lot of work ourselves. So uh, we have totally about 12 ideas in, in, in the book, six of them of Six of them have been implemented, actually. Two of them have been implemented fully. The Aadhaar today uh, has crossed 930 million people and will be a billion people by March uh, 2016. And uh, it will be ubiquitous, I think, in a couple of years. So it will be the world's largest ID system of that kind. Uh, and uh, then the another su successful program, which began again with uh, the support from the UPA and continued by the current uh, NDA government was the LPG subsidy, which has been a spectacular success. More than 130 million people today are getting LPG cash transfers directly into the bank accounts. Imagine 130 million people, we assume about seven to eight transactions per person, that's a billion transactions a year. They're running at a rate of three million transactions a day, which is cash transfers into bank accounts. And by the government's own uh, declaration, the savings have been about 12,000 crores in one year. Now think about it, that a project whose entire cost, lifetime cost is less than 10,000 crores, has given in one program 12,000 crore benefit in one year. That's the kind of ROI. I think business guys will like that kind of ROI. So it's a fairly high ROI, I think, uh, on what happened. So these two programs have been fully done. And obviously, the subsidy which happened on LPG now needs to be taken to other subsidies like kerosene, uh, fertilizer, food, uh, electricity, and water. In fact, we believe that the key, you know, this whole issue now about electricity reform where we are fixing the generation side and then suddenly finding there's no one to buy this stuff because all the ACBs are broke. And the key in our view is to convert electricity into cash transfers so that you sell electricity at market price and give the subsidy to the farmer as cash which is, so you separate the sort of subsidy from the product. And that also ensures that automatically you'll have 100% metering because to get the cash subsidy, you ought to be metered anyway. So there's, it gives an incentive to get the whole thing metered. So we believe that subsidy converting to cash transfers is today at about, ultimately can be as high as uh, 300,000 crores to the 400,000 crores a year. And that'll have a dramatic impact on the economy as well as take these organizations out of the subsidy net and they can focus on being competitive and the quality and so on. So these two, I think, are done in the sense uh, Aadhaar is done and the LPG is done, and hopefully with LPG done, they'll do the others. But the other things, you know, one of the things we have built is the platform for KYC, which allows you to have paperless transactions, the uh, whole uh, thing to go to a cashless economy through payments. Uh, then uh, the uh, one of the other thing that we were involved with was the design of the goods and service tax network, which is the backbone of GST which has been designed to really create a next generation architecture for making tax filing automatic for GST when it comes. So that's a huge thing that will happen in the next uh, couple of years. And then uh, the other thing which uh, we were involved in designing was the electronic tolling system, which puts electronic RFID tags on every truck, which allow trucks to move through the country without stopping, so that this whole toll issue, you know what happened here, right? People uh, burnt up toll, toll booths or something. So all that can be sort of fixed with that. So these are basically six ideas which we were already there. Two are fully done, four have to be done. And then we said, let's take a look at other things. So we looked at how to you know, look at uh, what the roadmap for health is, what's the roadmap for improving uh, the legal system and reducing pendency, what's the way to do uh, power sector reform. Uh, then. Uh, we looked at how the electoral system can be, how you can have a centralized voting uh, system so that when Deepak goes to vote, his name is still there on the voting list. 
which I think happened to you some time back, Deepak. So I think there's a lot to be done. And then we also talked about how the future of politics will be mobile first, because by the 2019 Lok Sabha election, uh, 500 million people in India will have a smartphone. So it'll be a mobile first election. So that itself means there'll be a radical change in the way you think of managing the, these things. And then we talk about expenditure. So it's basically, these are big ideas. Uh, we have given actually fairly detailed uh, thoughts about how to do it and also from our own experience in, in, in managing the system. Because one, one thing we learned is that uh, we face opposition from every side, right? So I think the big difference for someone like me who went from the private sector is that in the private sector, uh, the measurement of success is uh, very straightforward. You earn more profits, reduce cost, increase revenues, increase market share, increase earnings per share, get a higher stock price, you know, all that good stuff. We all know that game in some sense. And whether you're running a you know, pharmaceutical company or a software company or a housing finance company, the metrics of measurement are the same. Profitability, earnings, growth, so on. This, this government and public stuff is much more difficult to do because there's no one definition of success. And first of all, there are many, many, many people involved. There's, there are governments involved, there are bureaucrats involved, there are politicians involved, the cabinet is involved, parliament is involved, activists are involved, the judicial system is involved, you know, it has its own opinion on what has to happen. Uh, the public is involved, the media is involved. So it's really, it's, it's a cacophony of actors out there who all have a point of view, all of whom debate furiously on, you know, prime time television. And in that cacophony, in that chaos, you have to figure out a way to keep going at your goal and not be disturbed or sort of this thing. And make sure that every, every, at every step, those guys don't gang up to you know, fix you. It's very important. So I think the, how you navigate is, is very, very important uh, through the system. So this book is basically giving this uh, roadmap. And uh, I do hope that our, our final conclusion is that if, if we take up the 10 new projects that we have in the book, we should have 10 teams of 100, uh, 10 people each, which is 100 people reporting direct with one leader for each, who has to be an entrepreneurial leadership. It's not about just a leadership in a sense of somebody who, who figures out how to you know, sort of navigate that system. And they have to report directly to the prime minister because this needs cloud, this needs oversight, this needs air cover. And we think that's the way to really fix things at speed and scale. And technology is the only way that we think we can really do that. So I'll just walk you through a few slides uh, from the book. As uh, I think Udayan mentioned, uh, we have, you know, this is slightly ge geeky topic, you know, all this techie stuff. So we thought we should simplify it. And we have tried to uh, uh, simplify it as far as possible by using uh, diagrams in the book. So this is what we talked about. We talked about 10 grand challenges which require, you know, there are 12 platforms, two of which are done. So there are 10 grand challenges yet to be done. And we talk about 10 teams of 10 people each, the prime minister and therefore 101 people. So it's, 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 you know, you may say, oh, this is very simple, simplistic. But fundamentally, we're trying to force thinking into a way of thinking about this. And the most important thing is that this will require people from outside also in the system. You need to bring in leadership who have proven their ability to lead, manage, be entrepreneurial, deliver results in different environments. Because unless you do that, uh, you know, you can't really get this kind of uh, innovative change that you want. We also talk about why technology is difficult in government. I know it's a little difficult, but you know, there's, for example, tech knowledge is, is not that high. There's apathy. The, uh, uh, one of the big things about automation is power shift. The power shifts from the current guys to somebody else. So obviously the current guys who are losing power don't like the idea, so they start resisting all that. Then there's a fear of change. And uh, you know these, oh, all these concerns of privacy and security. And one of the lessons we learned is that very quickly negative coalitions start to come, form to stop you, to thwart you. And therefore, speed and scale is very important. Only if you get speed and scale, then only you will, you will sort of protect yourself against uh, uh, you know, something happening. And right from day one when we started, we said by the time the, ele uh, the next election happens, this should be so large and so useful that it it, it continues, and that's exactly what happened. So I think the fact that it, it went from you know, the last government to this government and it's flourishing under this government shows that if you really build that speed and scale and show the benefit of it early, then you know, it, it survives transitions, political transitions. So that's a very important uh, message for you know, if you're trying to reform anything. Because if you don't build it up and make it large and useful, then you know, it's very easily it can get knocked off by somebody else. And that requires you to implement very fast. 
So implementation speed, the momentum is very important because if you don't have momentum, you don't get scale. You don't get scale, then somebody can you know, knock it off. So you have to bring it to a large size as soon as possible. And we talk about why is it so important to use technology for this. You know, one is, of, of course, scale. If you want to solve a problem for a billion people, then you can't do it the old-fashioned way. You can't do some you know, Mickey Mouse stuff, manual stuff. It, it won't work. And today, what the internet world has shown us is that you can build technology for a billion people, right? Facebook has more than a billion people. YouTube has billions of views. Uh, you know, it, it, the internet world has shown that we can easily cope with a billion people kind of a user base. And therefore, we should think about technology for that. And also, it's far more uh, cost effective. We showed you that. You know, the total spend on this project so far is around maybe 8,000 crores, and already the savings are visible. So it's, it's very, very, very uh, cost effective. It's also a way to address enforceability, because the good thing is that if you define something in a file as a rule, somebody can or, or change that rule, because you know, it's just a question of another file, you know, and people who do files know how to do that very well. But if you embed your rules in software, it's far more difficult to change them. So it's a good way for enforceability of rules is to embed them in software. And then we talk about how we can build a model for uh, you know, uh, diversity and so on. So we, one of the big realizations we had is that uh, the Indian, uh, the government system is not designed for mobility. It's designed for static usage. In other words, if you look at the way government system thinks, they think that a person lives is born, lives, and dies in one place. It doesn't move. And therefore, there's no concept of mobility of anything. You, you have to get your ration from the same PDA shop. You have to get your health care from the same uh, health center. So we realize that in a, a world where migration is big, where people are moving from rural to urban and north to south and you know, Orissa to Punjab and all that, fundamentally, you have to have mobility of everything. And therefore, that's why we thought of the ID being not an ID which you carry in your pocket. I mean, you have the other card, but fundamentally, the ID comes from being on the cloud. It's online. So wherever you go, you can, you can use your ID. And that's, that's a conceptual leap, because that you, you have an ID which is mobile, which uh, travels with you. And the other thing is that the nature of government is, uh, because it's vertical, uh, people tend to think in the silos. So if I'm in charge of X, I only think about X. But problem solving is horizontal. It cuts across different areas. So that's actually difficult for the system to deal with because many, very often, uh, because we had to solve a problem which was in somebody else's department, the immediate response is, what are you doing here? You know, why are you coming and sort of meddling with our things? So you've got to, you've got to sort of figure out how to make sure that you cut across these uh, vertical silos and, and deliver something which is... Uh, uh, you know, which still works. This is uh, what we argue, that what we need are startups inside government. This actually is the example of, uh, in government you have scale, you have stability, you have, you have, uh, you know, you have uh, all, all kinds of people with all kinds of great experience. But the incentive is for process. It's for, you know, you're not penalized for not do delivering. You're penalized if you have not done the file work properly, right? That's how it works. So the focus is always on process, making sure you do everything right. Because everybody is worried that 10 years from now, some CAG will investigate you and you know, put you in jail or something. So everybody is very conscious of what goes on the file and how decisions are recorded. In, in the startup, it's all about speed. You, go, you, you deliver from concept to market in a you know, few months. It's agility. You, know, you do what are called as pivots or you know, turnarounds. It's about uh, having great experts. And incentives are obviously market incentives. So the startup is very different from government. The trick is how do we do a startup inside government? And that's what we talk about uh, in the book. So I'll just uh, hand over now to my colleague uh, Viral, who will talk to you about some specific examples of some of the things we talk about in the book. Viral? Thanks, Nandan, and thank you all uh, very much for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to walk you guys through a few examples of uh, each of the chapters in our book. And uh, of course, this is a very small glimpse of what, what the book is about. So hopefully, this should uh, persuade you to, you know, to buy the book and read it end to end. Um, 
Uh, one of the first things that uh, after we built Aadhaar and uh, you know, we were very clear that Aadhaar needs its own applications uh, without which it will just be a number. And one of the first applications we had was this uh, application of making sure that money reaches the last mile, that whether it's a Narega benefit or a pension um, or a scholarship, that there is an easy way to send money to everyone in the country. Uh, my colleague uh, who was uh, here at Aadhaar with us, uh, Praveen, uh, Praveen and I took uh, several trips to Jharkhand, out of which uh, you know, some of these ideas came out. And uh, this is the idea of a micro ATM. So imagine a million people, just like million top-up points or, or the millions of PCO centers we had. Why can't each of those also have a, a simple credit card-like device capture the Aadhaar, put your fingerprint, and do uh, simple banking transactions. It can absolutely be done. Millions of Indians are doing it, and we can uh, revitalize uh, uh, our banking. In the book, we present many of these diagrams uh, that give roadmaps. So this is a 10-stage, 12-stage uh, roadmap to a cashless economy. All of, these, uh, all of these 10 projects that Nandan talked about uh, earlier all start with Aadhaar. In this case, it's eKYC. You to open a bank account, you need tons of paperwork today. But with Aadhaar, you can just put your fingerprint and immediately, without any paperwork, open a bank account. You can do the same thing with a SIM card. But building on top of that, there's a Jandhan which has given accounts to everyone or subsidies, like the LPG subsidy that is going into these bank accounts. Um, regulatory innovations like payment banks, uh, you know, the, all the smartphone innovations that we are seeing. So if you really put all this together, you actually have a roadmap and you can build on this to go from where we are, which is a completely cash-based society, to a less cash society and eventually a cashless society. And I think everyone in this room uh, probably knows that, you know, uh, the, you know, how cash works in our economy and how getting rid of it uh, from the economy is essential uh, for the improvement of our society. This is the issue of the LPG subsidy. I think everyone is familiar about it. We already saw a large raise of hands of people participating in giving up the subsidy. And the important point here is that everyone here understands now how this works. What was considered a cerebral idea, which was like, oh, this can only be done in your dreams, and you know, how can you execute something like this countrywide, has actually been rolled out in a matter of, only a matter of couple of years, two to three years to every person who is uh, using cooking gas in this country. It has saved the government uh, you know, over uh, 10,000 crore rupees. And uh, if you just look at the underpinnings of this design, right, that by moving the, uh, the subsidy out of the companies and onto the balance sheet of the government, the companies have now been made competitive. They don't have these artificial losses. Tomorrow, anyone from the private sector can get into the LPG distribution. And the same can be done for electricity, for power, for water, for kerosene, for fertilizers. Moving, uh, moving forward, toll, you know, we all know the, the bunching of cars that happens either at the ceiling or on our highways as we go around just stopping to pay toll and collect the changes, uh, the change and, and everything. Um, I've actually traveled on the ceiling a several number of times, and those guys are very efficient. But if you go out, uh, if you travel across India, it's, I can assure you it's not nearly as efficient, and you have to spend a lot of time just uh, you know, idling your car with the petrol burning and just paying, uh, you know, paying and collecting change. But combined with electronic toll, which allows cars to move, cars and trucks to move without stopping, the, the second part of that is the GST. So if you take the GST and electronic toll in combination, which is not how many people have seen this, but we make a strong point about it in the book. If you combine these things, a truck could actually start from Kashmir and go to Kanyakumari without stopping, perhaps with two drivers driving in shifts uh, and without ever stopping the truck. And uh, this is essential for a common market, for integrating our economy, which, is, which currently operates as a collection of states rather than as one unified market. We also talk about the impact of technology on elections, both in the way the elections are conducted. You know, today you can only go to your own voting booth. You can't even go to the neighboring one. And if you move cities, it's almost impossible to get your name onto the new role. Why, why does it have to be that way? And at the same time, the last Lok Sabha elections showed us the use of technology in elections. And we think it is going to be more widespread. And we define the concept of a party as a platform, of how politics itself will be transformed through the use of technology as politicians connect directly with people, uh, directly onto their smartphones. We have a few more roadmaps in the book that touch upon topics that we did not actively work on. Everything I talked upon so far is, is are things that we actually worked on, that we wrote reports on, that became recommendations to the government, which have mostly been accepted. And 
Roadmaps such as these are our projections of these ideas onto some of the more tougher problems uh, that we did not work on hands on. This is the road to a healthy India, again, combining Aadhaar, electronic health records, smartphones, wearables, uh, and so on and so forth to have a completely healthy India. In fact, our calculation in the book is that every chapter of this book, if implemented, could have a minimum saving of 10,000 crore. That's a minimum. Actually, the real numbers, we believe, are much higher. But that's enough to actually provide health insurance to every Indian if you just implement all the ideas in this book. A similar thing for education, again, starting with Aadhaar, implementing the right to education, uh, outcome-based measurement, uh, you know, using MOOCs or video-based learning. The quality of teachers in our schools across the country is not the same and uniform everywhere. I think many of the people in this audience are actually uh, you know, uh, quite better off, but that's not what most Indians face. So, so how do we use technology to bring high quality learning and education to everyone? That's what we talk about in our education chapter. We already touched upon power, where subsidies in the power industry could be sent directly to individuals and have a large, uh, a large impact and reform our ailing power sector. Court cases, uh, standard uh, complaint within India is that the judiciary is too slow. It's, it's far beyond, behind the times, even behind the rest of the government, actually. And uh, the pendency of cases, people think that we need more courts, more judges, more of everything. But our view is that it is actually the executive of the court where most of the time is spent. 90% of the time is spent in moving files from one court to another, or in scheduling hearings, or in, in, uh, in getting a date. Um, if you just replace all of these things with technology, you can very easily just uh, increase the caseload of every judge, uh, get justice dispensed, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, strengthen our judiciary. The last one that we have on this is the expenditure roadmap, government expenditure. Many countries like Brazil today, you can actually start from the central government, the central treasury, and track every paisa that goes down through the system, down to the street light that was fixed. Why can't we do the same in India? All the information is out there. And uh, this is where, excuse me. Uh, the, there are multiple levels of governments uh, where information comes and goes. The fund flows are hierarchical, actually. So it starts from the central government, goes to the state government, goes to the district level, goes to the block development officer, and finally, and just maybe finally, actually reaches the last mile. Um, there are multiple studies done on how this can be addressed, how this can be fixed, and we propose a hub and spoke solution that actually can kind of bring out all this information by crowdsourcing it and by putting it out there on an, on an online platform and simplify uh, the way our expenditures are tracked. Finally, a paperless society, we already talked about eKYC. So using Aadhaar, it's authentication, and it's eKYC. We have got rid of ID, address, and photographs from every KYC document uh, uh, in any application in the country. If you are opening a bank account, or if you are buying a mutual fund, or if you want to trade, the basic KYC can just be done with the click of a button. But over and above, there is still the signature. So the e-sign that has been done by this current government, uh, notified by the CCA, actually can be uh, can get rid of your actual signature and replace it with a digital signature. And finally, the digital locker through which all documents, whether it be an agreement or whether it be um, a, a, a certificate from the CBSE when you pass your exam or, or a caste certificate, all of these things can be made completely digital. So cashless, uh, and also made cashless through, our, uh, through the roadmap we presented on cashless society. So imagine if all interactions with government were cashless, paperless, and presenceless. If you could do everything on your smartphone, you essentially brought the same experience that you see from uh, shopping on Amazon or on Flipkart, but with the government of India. And uh, those are the ideas in our book. We uh, invite you to discuss these on, on Twitter um, or, or right here with the audience. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Nandan. Thanks, Viral. Um, because we're running a bit late, I'll just dive into it. Uh, the IDFC Institute works on political economy issues, so it's a real treat for political junkies like us to be doing this. Um, Nandan, you're entering the third act of your life. In your first act, you created a $40 billion corporation. In the second, you created the largest biometric database in the world, conferring identity to close to a billion people. What are the key takeaways from each? So what did you learn from Infosys that you could apply at Aadhaar? And in the next act that you're pursuing, what have you learned from Aadhaar that you want to apply next? And uh, because the Bombay audience probably hasn't heard it in person, 
Is the political phase over? Oh, yeah. I have no competitive advantage in politics. <laughs> I have a disadvantage, actually, so. <laughs> OK. But maybe you want to answer the other questions. Yeah, no, I think uh, there are a couple of things in common. I think uh, in both cases, the, the lesson is that if you have a large enough vision, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, which you're able to energize and uh, enthuse people, then magic happens. You know, I think in both cases, in Infosys, we just, you know, we are a bunch of people under Murthy's leadership who had a vision of creating a global company, which sounded quite, you know. Outrageous uh, at the time. Quite, yeah. And we did it because that vision was always there. And the good thing about having a large vision is that it subsumes individual egos and so on. And we found the same thing in, in Aadhaar, that you know, we, we had a very uh, motley crowd. We had, uh, had some of the best people from the government. My colleague Ram Sevak Sharma was, I was employee number one, he was employee number two. And uh, you know, his career was opposite of mine. He had worked in the deep you know, regions of Bihar and Jharkhand. And I had you know, hung around this New York and London or something. So, so we, we came from different, but he was also from IIT. We, were able to, we clicked very well. And so we had a lot of very fine people from the government. And we brought in people from the outside. Viral is an example. You know, he was playing some, uh, what, Frisbee? Yeah, ultimate Frisbee in San Fra San Santa Barbara. And then he came down and joined us. And many other people like that, uh, great, great technology guys like Shrikant and Pramod and so many people, Jagdish, uh, you know, many, many people. And the fact that we were able to blend people from two very different cultures together, government people who we're used to that hierarchy stuff, and I am IAS, and you are IRS, and he's something else kind of stuff, and private sector guys who were much more casual in their shorts, first name basis types. So we brought these two cultures together because the goal was big enough. They all knew that we had to deliver 600 million Adhas in five years. So that, that, the, the, the sharpness of that goal sharpened the mind. It sort of distilled their thing and made them subsume their uh, Individual. individual differences, or even these government, private sector differences. So what next, if not politics? No, I think uh, the, the good news is that there's so much change that we can do from outside the system. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, my wife Rohini and I are doing is X step based on her experience in literacy and numeracy. So we're building a state-of-the-art platform on smartphones to address the literacy and numeracy challenge in India, which is you know, affecting millions of kids. Uh, that if that works at scale, will make will move the needle on uh, you know literacy in India. Uh, then uh, I'm working with. Uh, is anybody here from NPCI? Can you just stand up? Yeah, this is Mr. Hota. Actually, one of the and uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, oh, Dilip, uh, every, Rajendra, and everybody's here. One of the great stories of Aadhaar was the partnership between the Aadhaar organization and NPCI. Yeah. The NPCI is the National Payment Corporation of India. It, it actually is in Bombay. It's, a proud citizen of Bombay. It was set up by the banking system to run retail payments. Uh, it was, you know, originally retail payments in India were actually done by the RBI itself. So they started sort of divesting of that. Think of it as how the early MasterCard and Visa was. And it was a coincidence that that was set up exactly at the same time as we were set up. And I got a call from the then chairman, Mr. Nair, saying, we're starting this NPC. I said, what's that? He said, oh, we're doing all this payment. I said, good, let's meet. So we met, and that led to a fabulous partnership. So the entire financial inclusion architecture, along with Ada, was built by NPCI in partnership with them. And that is something phenomenal. <laughs> and uh, in, and uh, you, know, you know, I think Ra Rajiv's uh, launched the IDFC Bank, and uh, uh, he had the courage to try to do a demo in uh, the PM's house. <laughs> Because you know, I, I have always found that you start to do a demo in some government building, these guys jam the very signal. <laughs> so you can't do any online demos. I, was, I said, this guy's got guts you know, to do a demo in the PM's house. And it worked flawlessly. I saw the video, Rajiv. So that technology, which uses, uh, which of course they have improved upon, which was, but using Aadhaar for doing a cash withdrawal in a village in Hoshangabad was all built by NPCI. Right. So this is seriously good stuff. I mean, this in the West, they would have spent hundreds of billions of dollars doing this. We have, we have done, all of us have done this in a very cost-effective manner. Right. Um, Viral, so the way I'm going to frame this is there's a bunch of questions I have which are directed at each of you, and then there's a bunch that either of you can answer. But uh, as Nandan said, you were playing ultimate Frisbee in, in Santa Barbara, which is not such a bad deal. Uh, where, uh, you know, he said that if you're uh, overweight, they don't let you into Santa Barbara. It's only about, you know, surfing and Frisbee. Frisbee. And, you know. That's right. You were one of the co-inventors of Julia. Um, you have, you know, you were a computer scientist at UCSD. 
how did nandan con you into this hey, i mean mat bolo yaar kya hai yaar no no i mean this is a genuine question i mean i'm sure a lot of the younger people in the audience actually have the same question i mean they want to actually contribute what did nandan tell you that convinced you to give up ultimate frisbee and computer science and well not computer science quite but and move back to india actually it was uh, Yeah. So uh, actually, I had I was in India uh, for a conference. It was an NCAER conference in Delhi, and uh, I met Nandan for a sum total of 30 seconds. And uh, he said, "I'm doing this thing. Uh, why don't you think about it?" After that, we followed up with a 15-minute meeting. And I must actually recount a little bit about that, uh, which we write about in our book. Um, I, you know, I did not know Nandan before that personally, or even about him. And but the idea sounded really impressive. and i was actually shocked that nandan not only showed up on time but he actually called me and said that i'm actually running late and i'm going to meet you elsewhere and we had a very uh, you know crisp and clear conversation and i i mean i i made up my mind on the spot so i didn't even go back i had come back to renew my visas and i just stayed back uh, it took <laughs> it took 9 back months 7 years 7 years so, okay it, big, it took 9 months for me to actually get an appointment after that uh, at uida <laughs> He, he, for nine months, he worked as an unpaid volunteer. That's right. And there were a lot of people who actually worked as unpaid volunteers. Uh, Praveen, was Praveen awesome. included. Yes. Um, so that's it for the softball questions. Oh, oh. now that's. <laughs> now comes the tough ones. So one of the underlying themes in the book is the need for redefinition of the relationship between people and government. So one of the memorable lines in the book is. we are attempting to govern the world of google and facebook with a quill pen and an abacus That's from mckelwit but yeah mckelwit and adrian wolridge uh, so we grew up in this environment where the government was my bop now that attitude that model is not going to work for the size of the economy for the kind of country we are becoming how does one conceive of the role of government well i think uh, we talk about that towards the end of the book we talk about that government is is a platform which has to be designed uh, in a way that it's flexible adaptable because needs change in the old days you want to solve a problem you created one more institution but that 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 then you end up creating you know all kinds of sclerotic responses so we don't think for example uh, we we uh, so i think and you know people are used to a different world in technology right they used to real time they used to smartphone they used to instant feedback i mean the government should be like that i mean why should the pds systems be so archaic why can't the pds system be as efficient as the supply chain of walmart or tesco and they they deserve the same service so i think how do we bring that thinking into the whole system that's what we talk about yes but you see the problem is in the 2014 elections we had a campaign that was run on the back of minimum government maximum governance the reality seems to be increasing the size of government not reducing it so will government be ever be able to reduce the bloat that is caused by political compulsions and adopt what you describe as an hourglass architecture so so maybe i'll jump to viral first so that he can actually ex- ex- explain the hourglass architecture and then maybe nandan come back to you for how do you escape the bloat because that that waste needs to be thin yeah so we actually uh, maybe for the audience i might just describe what the hourglass architecture is so the internet is considered to be an hourglass architecture so hourglass you know it's 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 fat on the top and it's fat on the bottom and there's a narrow waist and the reason the internet works the way it does is because what is defined in the internet the basic protocols of tcp ip or the world wide web they are they are part of the narrow waist they specify very little and leave it to everyone else to innovate so if you come up with a new smartphone or a new browser or any new internet access technology you might come up with a wireless thing you might come up with cell phone internet 4g 5g 6g whatever Every, nothing changes on the internet you can still go and people can sell their goods on the internet people can buy they can read their emails they can do everything and this narrow waist idea is why the internet was so scalable it it actually you know in government we like to specify too much we like to lock down everything but what the internet did was it actually wrote down very little and and that's why it succeeded and we draw the analogy that was what we did with aadhar and uh, that's the prescription we make for these 10 projects that specify very little figure out what is the most important thing and then let the markets and innovation do the rest sure but given the political compulsions how do you reduce no. how, how do you bring the waste down no i think uh, more than the political compulsions i mean the because pol- politicians have the leverage to change things it has to do with the incentive structure in the system you are your power in the system is measured by the size of your budget and the number of joint secretaries that report to you 
I mean, th that's a fact. I mean, you know, because the joint secretary, see, if you understand how the bureaucracy works, the joint secretary is the most important person in the system because it's the last time that an uh, officer serves for a full five years in a job. Because after your joint secretary, after that you become, you know, additional secretary and special secretary and secretary and all that stuff. And typically those positions, uh, you don't last for, you're not in those jobs more than, uh, you know, one or two years max. So the real time, the uh, heart of when you can do some substantially is those uh, five years in, as a GS. And therefore the ministry which has the maximum of joint secretary is, is the guy with the clout. So that's not the model in which you can, the bloat happens because of that, right? Like when I took charge of the UIDI, they, there was a cabinet approval which had a budget of 1,400 employees mm -hmm. and 36 joint secretaries. Dream come true. I mean, like, wow, 36 joint secretaries, bigger than the Home Ministry or something. <laughs> it was as big as the Election Commission. Every state had a joint secretary. It was like, wonderful. And I went back to the, the PM and others and said, I don't need so many people. I don't need so much money. They said, are you mad? You're the first guy in government to come back and say, you need less than what you got. So we actually cut the budget down from 1,400 to, uh, we ran the project with 200, 300 people. We cut down the budget. I cut down the joint secretaries from 30 to 8. So this is all unusual stuff. The reason is that my incentive was different. My incentive was not to build an empire. Sure. My incentive was to get the damn job done and get out. So the moment that becomes your focus, then you say, what's the best way to get that done? So I think, so it, it cannot come from the system. It has to come from the political leadership to put people in charge who have a very clear mandate to deliver an outcome, are measured for that outcome, and we'll do it in the most efficient and effective way. And that's the whole heart of what we are saying in the book. OK. So one other theme that is similar is that you touch upon design and architecture of governance uh, quite a few times in the book. So I've often thought about this as well, as in why don't we use the principles of product design to governance as well? Because ultimately, it's about empathy for the end user, because your end user is, is who is touched by governance. Can you, can you dive into that a little bit? So how does one think of first principles, for instance, in this context? So even in the case of toll roads, the technology is great. But in a lot of cases, the design and the execution is fatally flawed. Yeah, so for example, uh, first thing is you, you need to keep the design very simple. Uh, simplicity is important, and then you layer it on top of the simplicity. If you make uh, designs complex, then they fall on the weight of the, the weight of their complications. So you have to keep it very simple. You obviously have to make it customer-centric or citizen-centric in this case. You have to make it asynchronous, which means that different people should be able to come onto your platform at different times. Because expect everybody to come at the same time is not going to happen. Getting all these guys aligned is not possible. So let everybody come at their own time. It will be asynchronous. And uh, so what you mean by that is each ministry can adopt Aadhaar at their own pace. If you look instance. at the whole design, it's loosely coupled, asynchronous. Different people can enroll on different days. Different people can come at different times. Different apps can be built differently. You have to make it a loosely coupled thing. You try to make it tightly coupled, then it, it fails. And then you need to make sure that uh, you, know, you design in a way that nobody feels threatened. You know, Because when we... Because we, we, the important thing was that we said we are not, uh, car see, if we had said we had a card, we would have been shot down. We, we, I also have a card. Who the hell are you to do a card? So you know, we're not a card, we're a number. You know, we're just giving a little number, and you, know, you do the card, you do the passport, or you do the driver's license, you do whatever card you want. We'll just give you a number. So then say, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do the card. In. So, so you design things in a way that you don't create uh, opposition or don't create, uh, uh, you don't create competition. Because, uh, you know, you, people outside think, tend to think that government is some monolithic thing. Actually, government is even more intensely competitive than the market. Right. But they're competing not for market share, they're competing for this stuff. You know, who does what and all that. So, so you need to sort of navigate and make your solution light and get through this. Actually, so, I would like to yeah. add that, uh, you know, the other architecture that we used in Aadhaar and, and that we prescribe in the book is architecture of choice. That often, you know, uh, you can only go to one place and get your LPG or you can go to one place and go to go for your PDS. But if you design for choice, and which is easy to do with technology, you actually bypass a lot of the problems in the system because you know, now the one PDS shop cannot hold you hostage if he, you know, I mean, imagine buying your uh, mobile top up from one shop and he says, oh, if you give me 100 rupees, I'll only give you 80 rupees worth of talk time. It doesn't happen, right? And, and so choice is very important. I, I think the important thing is we are trying to give to everyone what markets gave to the middle class. I mean, if you go back pre-91, you know, two years to get some Bajaj scooter and you had to call Rahul ji and maybe he'd you know, give you a scooter or something like that. <laughs> so it was like that kind. What, was that the trick? 
Well, I, I missed that one. I, I didn't know Rahul at that time, so I, I don't think I could have done that. But anyway, uh, so it was because there was only one scooter, or you know, you go to fly. There's only Indian Airlines, and you know, you're rude to that guy, and he won't let you fly. So people did not have choice. What markets did was markets created choice. So today, people are trying to sell your scooter or sell your cell phone, etc. But for people who rely on public services, there is no choice. In other words, liberalization never touched those people. You only touch the people who are purchasing power. So we said, is there a way to think of getting choice for everybody? And that's how the technology is used to give choice. So basically bring a pseudo market choice phenomenon to delivery of public services. Wait. Uh, Viral, can you tell us a little bit about the technological challenges you face? And specifically, the one that blew my mind was the problem of matching. Uh, when a person enters, it has to be matched against a billion other numbers in the system. Uh, how do you think of that at scale? What is that, 700 million billion calculations or something? I, I had done the calculation when we wrote the book, but I can, it's, there's so many zeros, it's hard no, to but, remember. But you know, let's say there's uh, 500 uh, million people in the database, and uh, 1 million uh, people enroll, then it's uh, 500 billion or whatever yeah. matches. It's, it's the world's first, largest system of its kind. The first guy does not require to be checked, right? Because the first person who's enrolled, there's nobody to check against. The second guy has to be checked against the first. first yeah. Third has to be checked against the first and second. So imagine the billionth person has to be checked against all the, the billion that came before him. And uh, actually, the, you know, we quote the chief architect, Pramod Verma, uh, originally we consulted with a lot of the experts uh, overseas and Pramod recounts his experience. They said, you'll need some 100 cricket fields or something full of some servers yeah, and yeah. some billion dollars and all. Um, but then you know, Pramod says that you know, if Google can serve the entire world's searches and Facebook can put a billion people online, why do we need all this stuff? And we actually had an internet scale architecture that, that delivered Aadhaar for a fraction of that. Currently, the, the way it's designed, the entire hardware and servers can fit in a large house. Well, it, it, it doesn't have to be as la large as Mukesh's house, even a small house. <laughs> even a reasonable house is fine. <laughs> there's, there's many people in this audience who might be going to an after party tonight. Um, Don't tell him I said that. Okay. <laughs> um, so a lot of Nandan, a lot of what you describe and what you've just spoken now reminds one of Yes Minister. In fact, you uh, quote a memorable line. You say, paperwork is the religion of the civil service. So we've basically inherited a system that was designed to rule India from London. Yeah. And, and then we merged that with the caste system. And merged it with the caste like system. Incredibly complex. Stuff. Exactly. And a lack of trust is the underlying principle. Uh, lack of trust within, within the government and then a complete lack of trust of the citizens of the government brand. Um, so many attempts have been made to reform this. Many commissions uh, have submitted reports. Nothing gets done. And many people also realize the fact that it is, yes, the diagnostics is important, the solutions are important, but ultimately what matters is that there's a huge implementation gap. How do you do this given this problem that we've just talked about? I mean, this hum humongous system that resists reform. Like we talk about in the book. So maybe you want to talk about it, the audience. Yeah, no, I think, as a, I think uh, the thing is that there's no one recipe in the sense that obviously each situation is different. But then some things we know. We know that speed matters because if the faster you do things, the less time for the negative coalition to emerge. Because if you take a long time, they'll all gang up and you know, go after you. So you do it quickly. So speed matters. Scale matters because scale makes it irreversible. So the new, when the new, new government comes, they can't, you know, they, they have to continue with it. It's so big. Uh, you need to make the solution as simple as possible to minimize the number of people who don't like it. The moment you make it thick and fat and tread on too many toes, then, then you're in trouble. Uh, you need to make sure that they all don't gang up on you at the same time. So you need to pick at each point whom you're going to quarrel with. Right. Because if you do all of them together, then it's not a good idea. So you do step by step. So you think through the steps and say, this time I'll, I'll deal with this fight, and after this fight, we'll take up that fight, and so on. So you need to think through all the, no, that's It's a practitioner's stuff. It's, and I can't say that what is the, there's no magic formula in each case. Right. But you need to have a very pragmatic way of navigating this thing. Do you have any comments on this? No, I think I completely agree that often people are looking for a silver bullet that, you know, just do this one thing and it will fix everything. And, and the reality is that you have to do a lot of little things. But they have to be part of a plan. Otherwise, uh, you and know, you have to accept trade-offs, you know. The, I mean, there, there are no perfect solutions. So you need to, you know, currently uh, Mr. Hota and I and others are working on, you know, 
making mobile payments work, and we're navigating through the system. We know exactly where the opposition is going to come from. So. Got it. So again, you've mentioned it in your slides as well, and also in the book, this notion that the big successes in the Indian system have really come from entrepreneurial setups, whether it's Vikram Sarabhai, Homi Baba, uh, V. Kurian at uh, GCMMF, and so on. Um, but you also admit that due to the incentive structures at play, uh, amongst the bureaucrats in particular, and, and in the government. The bureaucracy is extremely risk averse. The cost of failure is extremely high. So how do you do a startup with a bunch of people who don't necessarily subscribe to? No, no, no. The, the startup is not just a bunch of outsiders. OK. The key thing you to, to understand. You have no, to bring no, them on board. There's no way. A bunch of outsiders can't do this stuff. It's a blend. It has to be a blended mix. You need entrepreneurial leadership who can navigate the system and has got political air cover. You need great people from inside, and they're fantastic people inside. You know, many of them worked, worked for us, and I know them very well, and the brilliant, hardworking, high integrity, all that. Uh, so get those people, and also get uh, great people from the outside and blend them into a fighting team. It's not about only outsiders and all that. And, and um, you, so there is clearly opposition to laterals, right? To bringing yeah. in laterals, especially at a certain level and above. How, how do you deal with that? I mean, so the way the bureaucracy works right now is if you had something on social innovation in the government and you wanted to bring Mark Zuckerberg in, they would say Mark Zuckerberg is not old enough. Yeah. See, I think the, th the, the challenge we have and is that it's the, today the only way you can enter the government is at the beginning. So at 25, you have to some UPSC exam and join some civil service. Or at, like me, you know, at some, in your 50s, you've done everything, you sort of waltz in at the top. So these are only two models. The system is not designed for people in the middle. You know, there's no lateral entry possible at 15 years, 20 years experience. So that's a larger, and also because we have a permanent system, right? And in the US, when the president changes, several thousand people change. So especially if it's a change of Republican to Democrat, right? So a lot of people change. In, in India, when the government changes, some 30 people change. So why do you think things will improve? I mean, improve, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then at this point, <laughs> the, page 166 in your book, you actually quote an entertaining paragraph which you call the three laws of bureaucracy. Maybe you want to read from that a little bit. One sec. 166. Yeah. Okay, these are the three. Uh, we have called these as the three laws of bureaucratic evasion. The first law is we don't need this. Huh? It's too expensive. It does not fit the Indian culture and ethos. It's irrelevant to our problems. It's of dubious benefit. It won't work. It will upset everyone. This is not the way we have done things in the past. You know? <laughs> so you know, there are innumerable justifications as to why we, we don't need this. The second law is, why are you proposing this? It belongs to some other department. Why are you coming here? I mean, I remember when we we started working with um, uh, NPCI, uh, you know, the, the financial sector in the government comes under a department called Department of Financial Services, which is the Ministry of Finance. And they all said, what the hell are you doing here? Who asked you to come here to try to fix me? That's my job, not your job. So second law is, why are you proposing this? It belongs to some other department. And the third law is, it's already being done. You know, so at any given time, there are dozens of projects floating around the corridor of government in various status of complete, completion, and any of them can be pulled out to demonstrate that what you're planning to do is being done by somebody else. So, you know, it's a different matter that they may never get done, but they're there. So between, the, between these three laws, basically, it's very difficult to get anything done. Um, so is there one lesson that you've learned from dealing with the bureaucracy, one major lesson that you'd like to impart? No, let me say that my best friends are in the bureaucracy. So, okay. you know, and the, some of the people who work for me are absolutely outstanding. Right. So it's not like a, so they're fabulous yeah, people. It's a, it's a, it's a systemic issue. Yeah. It's a systemic issue because it's, an issue, it's a system based on hierarchy, right? So, you know, I don't need to be an astrologer to predict the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, career of a civil servant. I know that if I was born on, 
you know, June 12th, 1957. He's going to retire on June 12th, 19, uh, 2017. I know that uh, he's going to be a joint secretary from this age to this age. He's going to be an ad sec from this age. He's going to be a secretary from this age to this age. I know, I know all that. I know that the guy who joined the service five milliseconds before him, he has to call him sir for the rest of his life. <laughs> I mean, these are all known rules. So, you're, so while individually you may have fantastic people, they're constrained by this system. And the other thing which has happened is that in our effort to so-called, you know, make everything, uh, you know, free of scan and all that, we have tied up the system into knots, you know. So if I'm a bureaucrat, why should I take any decision? Right. There's no need. Because if I take a decision 10 years later, I'll go to jail. So forget it. I won't take a decision. So you have the CAG, you have the CBI, you have the CVC, you have the RTI, I'm Lokpal, Super Lokpal. I mean, which system is going to work if we create so many layers of, uh, you know, and all these guys have the benefit of hindsight. You know, five years from now, of course I can tell you why something went wrong five years back. What's the big deal, yeah? It's what, when I'm in the chair, I'm deciding. That's when the, you know, the, the tough thing happens, right? So this, you know, in, the, in America, they call it as Monday morning quarterbacking, right? You know, you see, on Sunday, you see the football games, and Monday morning, you just go, you should have thrown the ball and all that. It's like that. Our cricket, I'm sure. Uh, you guys do this. I don't watch cricket, so you guys must be all your cricket guys must be doing all this. No, no, then you do watch cricket. No, no. <laughs> well, I, with you, I watch. <laughs> so I think uh, the, we have made the system risk averse. I mean, there's a provision in the Prevention of Corruption Act which says that any, a decision taken, if it benefits somebody, even if there was no corruption, is corruption. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> what is this law, man? So why would I take a decision because somebody's going to benefit and then I'll be blamed even though there's no corruption. So you you completely gridlock the system. So why do you expect things to happen? Why do you think some magic will happen? No, no magic will happen. We actually have an anecdote in the book on this uh, exact topic, right? The, so there was there's this case of this civil uh, servant who actually bought tarp, tarpaulin because grains are often they show up at ports and they get uh, stacked up and then you know the monsoon comes and you know they can get destroyed. So the key thing was to buy tarpaulin, but uh, the L1 price was available from somewhere in Calcutta, and this was in, in, in Maharashtra. So he was like, should I wait for the rains to come and, uh, you know, uh, or, or should I just buy the expensive one from here? And he did the right thing. But, you know, a few years later, of course, an inquiry started that uh, why did you, you know, not buy the cheap stuff from here? And, of course, he had to, I mean, you know, defend himself. And See, I, well, one thing is I, we had the advantage. Uh, the other thing I learned is that I thought, you know, when we start a project of this type, exciting stuff and all that, they'll all line up to join. Actually, everybody said, what, this is crazy? Why would I do some risky project like this? So the only people who came to work for us were people who took risk. So there was self-selection happening. Right. So all the people who came to work, like Ram Sevak, were people who were gutsy guys who could take risks. So in that sense, I got the riskier people from the system. From the system. Um, you say you've turned your back on politics, and I'm taking you at face value at that. But let's hypothetically make... What in face value? Yeah? No, I'll take you at face... I mean, because most of us would like you to be in politics. But let's make you prime minister hypothetically. No, 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 hang on a second. We already have a what are the three most important government. areas that you'd work on? Hypothetically. Hypothetically. Uh, it's, it's not uh, sexy stuff. I, I don't care. Plumbing, plumbing, plumbing. OK, explain. One, create an onboarding ramp to get hundreds of the best and the brightest to join government. It's a, the onboarding ramp is important, because these guys don't have an onboarding ramp. One off, one off is not good enough, because one off, each guy takes some six months to be wetted and all that. You need an onboarding ramp to get hundreds of people into the system. And uh, because it's just too inbred right now. It's too inbred. It's the same people, you know, today he's in this chair, then he's in that chair, then he comes back to this chair. It doesn't work. Second, identify whatever, 10 things like we have done in the book, which are high impact, which have a huge multiplier, which can be delivered in three to four years with the, with the right uh, thing. And then create teams and give them complete support. And of course, run the regular stuff. Obviously, you want us to run the 9 to 5 stuff, but we also have to do this. And in some sense, you are not going to get dramatic change without that. And without dramatic change, you're not going to keep people happy. You're not going to keep people happy, people are going to get frustrated. If they're going to get frustrated, then you're going to have all these distortions coming in, religion, caste, this, that. All that are consequences of not being able to meet aspirations. And unless you fix the system, you're not going to meet aspirations. QED. Got it. Um, 
So I, I've got a few more questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So, um, so effectively, one of the problems we are facing is how do you do reforms in the absence of strong leadership? So, so the question is. Um, what do you mean by that? So typically, when you need, so even um, the stuff that you pulled off, actually, so the entrepreneur model that you're advocating for, the other word for an entrepreneur is a leader. Um, is a political entrepreneur is who you're talking about, is a leader. Somebody who can disturb an existing equilibrium, right? So in the, um, so, so in the absence of that, um, is there a way to think about this are we thinking of political economy? Are we thinking of reform at the wrong scale by thinking of it at the national level? Should we be thinking more at the state level, more at the city level? No, that, I think that's happening. I think my general experience is states are far more entrepreneurial, uh, much more open to ideas. They bring in people. They are, they are, their feet is being held to the fire, right? right? They're delivering services there, and you know they can have serious problems on the ground. Right. The center is a little more rarefied, you know, sitting in Delhi, Lutyens, Delhi, North Block, South Block, all that stuff. So you're not really, so it's a bit, uh, states are actually quite entrepreneurial. And, but I agree with you. I mean, this has to happen everywhere, not just in one location. Right. No, I'm, I'm just being, I'm just thinking back to the Chinese model where, you know, the experiments were tried very locally. They didn't try the price system all across China all at once. They tried it very locally in different places. Uh, Viral, um, you talk about platforms a great deal, but the one that I really was intrigued by was the idea of political parties as platforms. Um, so let me propose an idea to you, which is a bunch of politically minded people who wanted to do exactly that, to create an urban party using civic issues, waste management, air quality, uh, water supply, power, as a platform, and using mobile phones as your primary coordinating technology. Do you think that's a winnable proposition? Is it possible to just an urban alone party? I mean, I think the app is essentially that, right, uh, if you look at it. So I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, wherever there is a vacuum, uh, you know, some new ideology will come and fill it. And whether it's in the form of a new political party or an existing one, people, uh, politicians who use technology to deliver solutions uh, will definitely have an edge. Any thoughts? N no, I, I mean, it's not just technology. There are a lot of other things you need. But, yeah, it's, it's a way to, yeah, if I was doing a startup, yeah, it, that's the way to think about it. Okay. Uh, last question from me, um, and I, I think this is another one of the really intriguing ideas in the book, which is 90% of the labor market in India is informal, um, and formalizing the market, as we are seeing, is a very tough challenge. Now, here you make a very interesting observation, which is that India could have a very different structural transformation out of agriculture by thinking of platforms that can aggregate and thereby formalize thousands of jobs. So you, for instance, give Uber as an example of uh, a whole bunch of disaggregated informal cabs that come under one platform. Um, um, and, and you even talk about the work of Ron Coase and the theory of the firm in this context. Can either of you explain this? I have to. Uh, Niranjan won't read my book if I don't write about some economist. <laughs> <laughs> Niranjan, yeah. put you on the spot. So I think uh, the argument we make is that uh, if you look at the 20th century industrial development, it you because of what Ronald Coase said, he talked about the theory of the firm, which was that in, in, in economic activity, there are high search costs, high coordination costs, high transaction costs, which is why it can't be everybody doing business with everybody. You need to create firms so that firms reduce those costs. And that, that's very seminal work he did in 1937. And the large firms in the US, or the large industrial organizations were a consequence of that world, right? Because the coordination costs were very, very high. What the smartphone and all this technology has done is that you know, it's allowed a way to virtually aggregate producers of one into an organization. So you can- And reducing transaction costs. Yeah, because everything is on the phone, everything is using a map and so on. So uh, payments are automatic. So Uber is an example. So, and I think it works for Indian political economy because in urban India, there's no land anyway. So you can't open some big Walmart or Tesco. The you know, land acquisition will never happen because of all these junjets going on. You know, so uh, organized labor, all the costs of labor are high. So why not, instead of trying to fight and say we'll become industrial, why not say we'll go to this model where in every industry we'll create virtual aggregation. So aggregate thousands of farmers into one mega farm, but they own their land, but they are all coordinated with common things, or take thousands of retailers and make them into a big retailer. You know, basically use today's technology to, instead of creating large physical organizations, 
aggregating the virtual virtually. organization. And that's and a lot of the work I'm doing on the startup side today is actually trying to create aggregations of that type. And and do you have a sense of where the big massive job creation might happen next? I mean, given all the problems with automation on the one side and factor market reforms on the other side. No, I think uh, just the uh, efficiency of creating these aggregations will create a huge employment. Okay. And, and also productivity gains. Okay. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the audience. I think what we'll do is we'll take three questions at a time, just because I suspect many of you will have questions. Um, the mics are, where are the mics? Um, so I see one, two, is there anybody? Yeah, three right here. So if you can just give these three hands. If you can just keep your question short, please, yeah. in the interest of time. Uh, you talked about? You talked about disruption in education as one of the components that you're addressing. And I wanted to ask you that uh, in education, it's not just about the quantity of people you're educating, also the quality of people. Because how do you address the lack of ethical behavior, the lack of empathy, and the increase in stress, et cetera, that one finds amongst a lot of students in, the, in India? For example, I returned from the United States after 28 years there. And I'm conducting an experimental class here at a prominent engineering college and a medical college. And the rate or the stress levels and the bad behaviors of the student are extremely high. So you can teach online education, but how are you going to build the character, the moral character, the civic sense, helping someone who is struck by a car on the street where nobody rushes out? How are you going to build? Because if the foundation of the population is poor, yeah. which is the people and the intellectual capital, how will we progress as a society? Oh, yeah, yeah. So can we just, uh, I, I just request you to have sh much shorter questions, please. There is a lady here who had a question. Hi. Um, I have a very simple question to ask you. What is the impact you are expecting from the book coming from the people and the government? There's something at the back of your mind that this is what I expect from the book. Okay. I saw one other hand in the middle. I'll, I'll, I'll come to... Boss, I can't handle too many questions. I remember. I just... Th three questions. Hello. <laughs> Is there somebody, uh, is he getting a question or not? There was somebody in the middle who had a question. But if not, there's a question here. It's fine. It's OK, just go ahead. Yeah. You talk of uh, creating, embedding uh, systems and making them simpler. That would make things very easy. And this technology is going to reduce a lot of uh, bureaucracy and thereby a lot of uh, joblessness is going to increase. Now, how does that solve the, the problem? Jobless in the country or in the bureaucracy? Uh, in the, in the yeah, these are two different in the things. Country, in the country. We well, have a bureaucracy in our house. We have a bureaucracy in the private enterprises also. Okay. So how does that uh, solve the aspirations of the billions of the Indians? Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, I think to, to, the, to the first question, obviously, a technology is not going to solve behavior and ethics and, and so on. But if at least we can scale up opportunity, both in jobs and in uh, education, the stress level should come down. And part of the problem today is that the number of seats in these colleges have not gone up, but the number of aspirants have gone up, and that stress causes some distortion. So I think it's more about addressing that imbalances. I think the purpose of the book is really uh, multifold. I mean, obviously, uh, we hope that it will be read by people who make decisions to think about how uh, we have to think of technology-based solutions. And when you talk about technology, we're not talking about e-governance or putting a website. I think this, this is about reimagining governance with technology. It's a little more, sort of, uh, it's a bigger thing than, it's like reimagining the whole thing. So we hope, similarly, even for the readers, we're hoping that they realize that the, solu the solutions have to be of this kind, because currently, in the system, the solution is either to create more and more checks and balances so that all this, uh, this gridlock happens, or to create more and more uh, Lokpals and Super Lokpals, hoping that they'll catch some guy, or to make some law tighter and you know, put him in jail for longer. None of those things are going to solve any problem, because that's, that's, you have to go to the root of the system. So I'm hoping that this will get people sensitized uh, to that. And your question was on. No, I think if you can bring in efficiency in the economy, the job creation beyond the bureaucracy will be so high, no? 
You don't think so, is it? That's okay. You don't. Right. Um, so, so just to just to prove that my yeah. So, sorry. No, no. I was. It's okay. Um, just to prove that my vision is still 2020, I see Alok Shirsagar at the back wants to ask a question, and uh, another hand up there in the back, and I see that is Arun Nanda. Even my side is good. Oh, fantastic! I can't see behind the cameras. Hi. You know, one of the problems that I find that even after 68 years of independence, we have two big problems to deal with. First, lack of credibility. You go to the government with a proposal, they think, Isme, iska kya hai? And the second problem, so there's everything is looked at suspicion, and you raised it as one of your first laws. And the second problem we find is that those few hundred joint secretaries are the only knowledgeable ones who know and we people don't know anything who manage businesses or other things. You know, there's a huge mindset difference. And how do you change that? You know, while I just glanced through your books, a lot of good ideas have come. But you know, having worked for 44 years, this is something I've start. You go with an idea, the first thing, there's a suspicion. Does Mahindra have an angle? Does Arun Nanda have an angle? And the second thing is that, hum jada jante hain. I know more. I know more, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, just one more. Yeah. Just take one more question, please. Hello. Firstly, thank you very much. It's incredibly inspiring what you've done, uh, both in your prior roles as well as what you've planned to do through the book. I have a question regarding uh, privacy and protection from cyber attacks when we create more technology-based systems. I'm sure you've thought about it. It's one of the issues that we need to think about going forward as you aggregate all this data. What are the sorts of safeguards required in that context? Yeah, no, I think uh, that's very important. And uh, there are a number of things we have done, uh, keeping the design simple, not accumulating data, encryption of all data end to end, having an architecture where the data is distributed so it's not in one central place. So the whole host of things that are done. But we have to be prepared for, uh, in, in the digital world, Data about people is going to be, you know, much, much more. I mean, that's that's inevitable. But in fact, what we have today is much worse. That data is is in the hands of companies and governments, and we have to find a way to flip it around and put people in charge of their own data. In some sense, one of the, some some of the things we are working on using Aadhaar architecture, they actually put the data in in the hands of the uh, you know person as opposed to the hands of somebody else. To Arun's point, I think, Arun, the point is that on the other side, they have the same complaint. They say everybody is coming because there's some angle. So you know, it's a mutual suspicion kind of situation. And it's also true, because the guys who go to government are the guys who have some angle. Because the guys who don't want to do, uh, don't want to, uh, want to do their own business rarely go to the government. So the guys who go are the guys, because, uh, so I think it's a mutual suspicion thing, which uh, I've seen on both sides. And I've had business guys coming to me, and I start also suspecting them because, because having run a business, I know exactly what his angle is. So I know exactly what he's trying to get out of me. So you know, I've, I've seen both sides. So it's, it's a tough one. I think simplicity of the regime, ease of doing business, reducing discretion, automation, uh, all, all these things are required. But it's difficult to break down that mutual suspicion. I saw two hands at the back. Yeah, at the very back. I, I'll come further. Yeah, hi, Nandan. Performance scorecards or digital cockpit helps run we businesses. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay. Digital cockpits help run businesses at the board level uh, in terms of driving execution and performance and customer centricity. Is there opportunity to drive the gov governance from the prime minister level to the chief minister using cockpits and dashboards? Your thoughts on that? Cockpits and dashboards. Yeah, I mean, you can't run only with cockpits and dashboards, but. But I mean, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, in Aadhaar, we have everything is on a dashboard. You know, I can you can go right now to a website. You know exactly how many people have enrolled, how many people got Aadhaar, how many people, all that. So we designed it for uh, for that kind of an approach. But I mean, there's a limit to that because also it's about people and you know politics and all that stuff. But yeah, you can definitely do a lot more to improve the digital outcomes displayed in a more uh, organized manner. Uh, could uh, Aadhaar have been more uh, user friendly because many people still don't have Aadhaar because of many people don't still have Aadhaar 
Because of requirement of documents and other things. User friendliness. The user friendly which aspect? Means uh, since you are already taking the fingerprint and the eye retina in Aadhaar. Yeah. Means it will be very difficult to replicate or duplicate. So instead of having documents like pen card and ration card in many places, could it not have been only the fingerprint and the scrutiny? Yeah. So it could not. Oh, you're saying why any document at all? Many yeah. people have not availed of other because of not Perfect. documents. Yeah. yeah, actually, we designed it also for people who have no documents. So technically, uh, even a person without a document can enroll into other. You see, again, you know, you're dealing with a system which is used to a lot of documents. If I told them that no document, only eyes and uh, fingerprint, you think you'd have been able to get anything done? I mean. Nandan, Nandan, in a previous conversation, uh, uh, coined a memorable ex expression for this. You called it radical incrementalism. Uh, I still remember that. A uh, couple of hands in the middle. Yeah, in the middle here, right hand side, for us at least. Hi. Oh, oops. <laughs> Perfect. No, no. All of us are culprits. Don't, don't make it, make it out as if we are not culprits. We are all culprits. We are all in this together, and uh, we are, we all have to work and fix it together. It's I, I've met enough people in every walk of life who are culprits. So. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Vandana Shah. Um, Nandan and Viral, my question is to both of you. It's a very simple question. Uh, I'm a lawyer, and I'd like to be part of the, of the reforms that you're talking about in the book. So I just I sort of know as an answer. If it's yes, I'm with you guys. If it's no, well, I just have to look at other avenues because I've been working as a lawyer now for 10 years. I've been trying to work out judicial reforms. My book is called X-Files. I write about 20 articles a month saying how the system yeah, so should get reformed. What's oh, your sorry. question? So the My question is, can I join you she guys wants to work with you. in the part of uh, the legal and judicial reforms? I mean, I work with the clerks. I sure, know sure. the... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, right now yes, we're not doing no. anything, but, uh, <laughs> but, but by the way, what the, 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 uh, we are talking, I mean, I think we, what we did in Aadhaar, we came up with a structured way of engaging with outsiders. So we had a volunteer program, sabbatical program. So right now, to be honest, we're not doing anything except giving our ideas in the book. So nothing on the legal front yet. <clears throat> okay. A um, couple of hands here. I'll just, yeah. I think Ashok, Ashok. Yeah, has, Ashok has a question. We should give the front. Talk about political cover. Uh, but the fact is, your biggest opposition came to the NPA in Chidambaram. <laughs> NPR, you mean? NPR. NPR, NPR Within the government. Almost got shot down. No, I think. Uh, what is the difference to explain? Well, see, you need. In, in, in the case of. Uh, in, the, in the UPA days, I had complete support from the entire leadership, right? The Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, Mrs. Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi, Mr. Mukherjee, and frank, to be fair, Mr. Chidambaram also. So uh, it's just that on different issues, different people have concerns. So it's not like one thing. You have, you have to figure out on which, which issue who has a concern, because... Uh, so what is the difference between NPR and Aadhaar? NPR and Aadhaar. You need both. No, I told you now that Competition in the system is like market competition, right? So it's no different. So the, if we had a job of giving an ID to every resident, they had us another project to give a citizenship card to every citizen. And so it was, in some sense, competing visions of what to do. Their, their vision is a vision of security. Our vision was a vision of development. But because the visions were different, but the underlying thing looked similar, like you give some give a number of cart to everybody. So everybody said, why are they doing that? We will do that. You know, usual stuff, yeah. Sir, company bhi hota hai, sir. Actually, the NPR is also using Aadhaar as its foundation. Yeah. Finally, we, we resolved it by making uh, Aadhaar as the back end of NPR. So it's, we sorted it out some several years back by, you know, sort of bringing the two together. Gopal. Gopal, you have a question. And then, do you have any insight as a result of your exposure to the issue of central and state? So let me just expand so that you can be specific sure, in sure. your answer. There are central subjects, there are state subjects. There are state subjects like agriculture, and yet you have a central agriculture minister. The question really arises, why do you have one? The states believe that they are the front end of the coal face, as you have 
alluded to, and most of us would agree. But the center feels that the states are irresponsible. If you give them any funds, they misuse it. If you are running a central system, then I can see the logic of everything, the very powerful logic. But when you get down into things like education and healthcare, do you have any sense of how to bridge this gap of yeah. whose state thinks the center is irresponsible and conversely? No, I think it's a great question. And I think one of the, in my view, one of the most significant achievements of this government is actually empowering the states. Uh, they've done that in two, three ways. One is uh, uh, by abolishing the planning commission. They've eliminated that whole step of going, you know, going the chief minister going to planning commission to get his allocations done. So that's gone. The second thing which happened was the finance commission increased the allocation of what's called as unrestricted money, or uh, which was not tied, untied money from 32% to 42%. The third thing is that uh, they are encouraging states to, there's a process under, I think, 254.2 of the Constitution, where if a state government changes a law of a state subject, it can come to the cabinet, cabinet approves, and the president signs off. For example, when uh, this uh, Rajasthan did some changes on uh, uh, right to education or land, and recently uh, Tamil Nadu did the same. They're saying we welcome that. So if state wants to advance on uh, reforms, they're welcome to do so. In fact, that's what they're saying now on land. So I think both on uh, giving this room for states to make their own laws, which they will support, as well as increasing the financial allocation. I think the degree of uh, empowerment of states in the last few months has been something we should uh, give them credit for. I'm sorry, I've been waiting to ask one quick question. No, I haven't finished. So I think yeah. the way to think about this is that rather than using money as the way to get people to come and see you, we have to say, how do I add value to you? So our, our whole thesis is that Platforms built by city by the center can be used by states on a voluntary basis. Uh, for example, uh, you can build a PDS platform at the center. States can use that technology or so on. So we think the focus has to go from control to value addition. I know that may be a you know miracle, but oh, that's the direction. Uh, the last few questions. So that guy was yeah. yes. complaining Sorry. that he's yeah. standing and yeah. Uh, I read an article by Swaminathan Ayer in the Economic and Political Weekly about uh, cash-based transfer versus in-kind transfer. Now, what they said is if you have an Aadhaar-based cash transfer, the cash is fungible, so they might use it for different purposes and not really for food subsidies. So, was this sort of thought about? I mean, not just food before any kind of subsidies when no, you plan. No, this is a classic left-right argument in, in, in this cash transfer business, right? So the people on the left, I mean, political left, say that uh, if you give cash to people, they'll blow it up on booze or something, and they won't spend it on food. And people on the right say that people don't be paternalistic. You give people the money, and they'll figure out what's best for them. So this is a political argument, and depending on your ideological affinity, you will take different positions. From an Aadhaar perspective, we are neutral to this. So Aadhaar can be used to give cash, or Aadhaar can be used to make sure the rice goes to the right person. So to us, we are giving both options, and we leave it to the policymakers to decide in this each context what they will use. Um, there was one last question here. Sunil. Yes. Thank you. Um, Nandan, uh, you obviously uh, done a great bit when with the UPA government on the uh, starting off with the Aadhaar. Now, the current uh, government, including the Prime Minister, has announced the Digital India Initiative in a big way. From what you have seen, and perhaps from the outside, is the government truly organized to take this Digital India Initiative to its logical, I wouldn't say conclusion, but down the road from and I uh, refer to your first slide about organizing and getting, you know, being having entrepreneurs. You were one of the entrepreneurs that the previous government had got. Is it something that the government has, you think, already has a great plan? And if not, what should they be doing? Well, let me first say some of the good things they've done on Digital India. One is embracing Aadhaar wholeheartedly and going up from 600 million to 920, 930 million now. So that's. And in fact, the Prime Minister has a monthly review called Pragati, where he reviews Aadhaar progress, among other things. So that's, that's very good that the top person is reviewing this personally. The second is the, uh, in, uh, the whole uh, LPG subsidy. It's, a, it's great. They saved 12,000 crores, world's largest cash transfer. Mr. Pradhan has been very strong on that. So these are two big achievements of this government. 
Third one is they launched two platforms. One is called eSign, which allows you to digitally sign documents with Aadhaar. And the other is a digital locker system, which allows you to store documents. For example, I buy an insurance policy from you or from your former uh, company, and automatically the document can be stored and so on. So that, those are all good things. But we feel that if you really want to get the full power of this, of reimagining government from, with technology, then you have to bring in uh, entrepreneurial leadership, empower them, give them strong teams, and make it happen. And that is obviously not, not happened yet. Thanks. Viral, there's a question that nobody seems to have asked. What are you up to? And what next for you? Um, I'm an inventor of this programming language called Julia, and uh, that's what I've been. Uh, I actually started working on it when I joined Aadhaar uh, along with uh, Nandan. It's open source, and uh, now it's uh, becoming quite popular, and I'm spending all my time on it. On Julia? Yes. All right. Uh, we've run out of time. Um, Nandan and I, when we were outside prepping for the session, his question to me was, why are you making this so long? Everybody will leave by 7.30 anyways. Uh, it's 8.15, Nandan. Not a single person has left this room. I think it's a testament to you. Uh, it's a maybe, testament maybe the to par parties in this town start late. Huh? And, but more importantly, uh, and I just want to say it out loud. People, you guys, uh, you Viral, people who have worked, you're heroes. And I think we should, and you've written a great book. And I think we should give them a big round of applause for what they've done for this country. Thank you. And let me invite yeah. Bunty. Yours. Uh, I'm going to have a vote of thanks given by our supporter, uh, IDFC Bank. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Lal, who is the managing director and CEO, will give the vote of thanks for the evening. <laughs> but before that, I just want to acknowledge some of the people in the audience today. We have many of our corporate members here. HDFC, Mr. Deepak Parekh is here. IDFC, Mr. Limaye is here. And IDFC Bank, uh, Mr. Lal is here. BSC, Mr. Ashish Chauhan is here. Dalberg, Varad Pandey is here. And uh, Gopal with Tata's, who have been a long-term supporter of ours. And then we also have some, and Mr. Kothari. Uh, as well as here. He's one of our corporate supporters. And, uh, and we have um, uh, Ashok Advani here, who's been on our global council. And of course, Deepak has been on our, Mr. Parik has been on our global council for, I think, over 20 years now. So, and Mr. Sunil Mehta is here. He is uh, on the board of directors of the Asia Society India Center. And now, a short word of thanks uh, by Mr. Rajiv Lal. <laughs> no, no. Uh, if you really had to be correct, uh, Ms. Chan, you should have called me Dr. Law. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, just to say that uh, we are all here because we are great fans. So uh, it's been truly a privilege uh, and honor to have been able to support this program. It's always wonderfully refreshing. Uh, to hear views uh, coming from London. I just wanted to, and, and his colleagues and the people he brings together, Viral being uh, a prime example, I just have one anecdote to, to share with you. So when we were embarking on this uncertain journey, lurching towards banking, um, uh, I'm not, ha not having had any banking experience. I thought the best person to start with would be Nandan. So, yeah, he gave me a long lecture. Actually, not a very long lecture, a very brief uh, uh, lecture. And he's, he's very fond of billions, as you can see. There's realizing a billion aspirations and a billion that and a billion that. In that spirit, he says, Rajiv, I have one idea for you that you must pursue as you try and build this bank. So I said, what? He says, well, you need to serve a billion customers with just 100 people. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I can tell you we've been, uh, since that day, working very hard towards uh, making that happen. And I can absolutely subscribe to the power of a very simple uh, but grand idea. Nothing like that. Uh, to focus the mind. And I think what we've heard today is really a very imaginative application um, of solutions, potential solutions, to a very difficult class of problems that we face in this country, which is last mile delivery. 
last mile delivery across the board, it's not just government, but it's also the private sector, is where things break down. And one of my learnings in these 18 months now of trying to apply this principle to banking is that, you know, uh, having re really never quite thought about technology um, seriously, I was under the impression that, well, you know, if you're trying to deliver a service to the last mile, to the customer, right, how can you do that using just technology? Isn't there an element of personalization of a human touch that is totally indispensable in delivering that service. And one of my learnings is that, of course, some element of human involvement is, is important. But technology being what it is today, there is great potential to actually personalize it. And I think, therefore, there are some things that you cannot use technology to deliver governance for, but there are 80% of issues that I truly believe can be significantly improved in a customized fashion um, using technology. So, Nandan Viral, thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you.